Um, as you know, the scheduled events on campus this month are part of the Year of Wellness's focus on domestic and sexual violence. It's an unfortunate fact that a huge, a preposterously huge number of men and women have been subject to sexual and or domestic violence, and it's an also an unfortunate fact that some of us this afternoon are among their number. It's essential we feel that these issues are discussed as part of the common and open dialogue. That's what artists do. And our performances this afternoon will address some of those issues. However, if you have a strong emotional response that goes to your own experience, that's what our counsellors are here for. Please see them for support and assistance. They have resources. We have a fabulous healthcare centre. And they also have uh, telephone numbers and things that they can refer you to. So I'd like also to welcome artists Pat Payne and Dora McQuaid. And they are extraordinary people. Um, we can talk about what they do afterwards. I'd like to get directly into the performance. And Pat Payne, who is our first, she's the body on the floor, in case you hadn't noticed. Um, Pat Payne is an amazing artist and performance poet. Please welcome Pat Payne. I'm that one that you're afraid of. I'm that black girl who kicked your ass in third grade and you've never gotten over it. I'm that sassy person that you assume has sass and not class. I am scary after dark in the middle of the day behind you. I'm qualified. I literally wear my CV on my chest. I'm that person who doesn't look safe or friendly or happy. The one who's articulate. I'm that woman that you think should entertain you. I'm the one who will pimp slap you when you're fully aware and looking. I'm the one that's not going to hide or step away. or smile to make you feel comfortable, I'm that one. I am not presidential black. I'm too dark to be trusted. I smile. And you're not sure what's going to come after that. No radio, no media today. I will listen to no opinion save my own. What can the world teach me about sorrow? James Farmer consecrated the earth with his sperm, drawn and quartered, sealed in the furrows of rage, split open. He smelled of sweet grass. Abhorring perfection, zealots detonate their faith, then falls the serum from the sky. The angel smirks, the ejaculate of God, the shorthand of divinity, gory, desperate dots and dashes, dots and dashes, dots and dashes against my windshield, the Morse code of heaven. Serena Moore, Clementina Pinckney, Matthew Dobbins, Michael Brown, 
William Lemon, Tim Kyle, Freddie Gray, Eric Gardner, Yvette Smith, Essel Lance, Leaning on the everlasting arms attached to our pitiful ambitions, we serve as cosmic fodder for our saints. And me and Octavia Butler, we share in a dispassionate God who laughs as he watches the sun in ruins at the end of each and every day. the conceit of laying concrete over earthquakes, the undercurrent of rage rippling sidewalks like white water rapids, detached mazes, detached emotions, stars detached from their meanings, from the flags that we wave, tinkling toy pianos playing bad luck and El Nino Perdido, anthems of the perpetually displaced. We alternate between the huts of our ancestors and the mansions of our dreams, Work clothes masking the holes in our closets made by hidden knives. Our slippery tongues dressed in bow ties fling ninja stars. Battered hands that pray for the strength of elders, the strength of our unions, and the love of children outlasting, outlasting God, outlasting these bricks and mortar. We are seasick with the shifting times, the changing climes, and the skies are ablaze with fury from lightning promises made and broken. We resonate with the innocence of hummingbird blossoms, the scent of pollen and hibiscus red lips. We vacillate between memory and imagination, homeless campsites and pristine suburbs. But, but the root of it all, the root of our spirits filled and dripping with the amber manna of infinite possibilities lights the night sky. And these roots entwine all of us, united by divine breath. So breathe deep. Your neighbor is summoning you to come out and play. I'm water, water, water woman, water. Water, water, an amazing vermilion vision levitating on the biceps of blackamoors, her feet unseen ruffled sand. A diaphanous swath of swaying silk, her lyrical hem imitates a Ming figurine. Hair feathers whisper in the breeze, consorts attentive to her mellifluous flow orient her beautific smile to the moon. Ashira to Tiga. I call the names of the goddesses of water, she who walks upon water and the sea. Where can the sea bathe unashamed without the green eyes of moonlight haunting her? Startled gulls spiral into confetti updrafts as she lifts the ocean's petticoat of foam to test the temperatures of arcing waves. A carpet of grunion glitter between sandalwood toes Sailing mists engulf her elegant entourage as a cerise mirage vanishes into silent fog. Samate, goddess of sand beaches. Mamiwata, Shedna, Talasa, Tiamat, Yemaya, Yolkoyestan, Turquoise woman. Water is woman, is water webbing, ebbing, swelling, birthing, seeping, melting, freezing, crystallizing, boiling, shrouding, embracing, always adapting. Woman is water, is living water. Half our earth, portal between dimensions of manifestation and dreams, prayer and life. Mother is water, is prayer, is life, is a mirror, is beauty, is a breath of mist, secret of alchemists. Mother is water, is goddess, is water, is restorative. Rejuvenating fountain of divinity, Red Sea woman is water, 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 quenching wave upon wave of infinite thirst. Water is woman, is goddess, is magic, is. Chak, jaguar, Oriyu, rainfall, 
rain, waters, river, water spirits. These droplets are beads in my story belt, a way to remember dances that brought rain and love to my barren heart. An Oriyu water spirit channeled over my body chose its way over the sweetest parts of me, following curves, following into caresses and crevasses, washed away more than dirt and dust. It scorched and soothed my soul at the same time when my hands were steepled in prayer. Beauty. Your birth was prefaced by water. Spilling out of the cavern you'd hidden in, months spent floating in dream state, named before your first tear, first bath, you squirmed as if water was unfamiliar, as if you hadn't breathed fluid in your indescribable amniotic sea before lungs were introduced to air, before your rainbow crowned my world. Idimeli, Okoyumi, Oshun, Sirena, Vedenemo, Anix, water nymphs, sprites, goddesses of love, water spirits. Power is a pastel colored matrix of elusive containment. Valves and knobs and tubes and tanks and levels and electric lawns, capricious nurturer giving or withholding, gifting or giving, power lies in knowing everything is malleable that butterflies' wings can cast winds into water spouts. Water is the muse of form, the droplet eternally suspended over an infinite pool of desires. One descends, another is poised to fall. Water wears masks of rain, river, spring, deluge, takes on the expression of your desires, pours ice into your cup. She who turns a spigot controls your reality. But water lies low, adopting the contours of any vessels that seek to hold it, always disguising its depth by evening its placid surface. Respects no boundaries or weakness, disappears but is truly never gone escapes as stealthy molecules driven by wind. Who truly rules the water? It answers only to the moon. I will read one more. Hmm. Yes. So since 1945, there have only been 26 days of worldwide peace. Of the past 3,400 years, the world has entirely been at peace for only 268 days, roughly 8% of recorded history. There have been 994 mass shootings in 1,004 days in the United States. This poem is 311 days. In the stillness, did guns shoot iridescent soap bubbles? Did landmines spray confetti? Champagne corks go silent? Were babies born smiling? Did peace stop her endless pacing around the earth? Did all women simultaneously menstruate to feed the earth her meal of blood? Did widows lay down their day-to-day -day diversions and scream? Did politicians go deaf from the sound of laughter or pick fights with their loved ones? Did assassins exchange gifts Crematoriums throw barbecues? Did numbers fade from the arms of Holocaust victims? Did diasporic spirits frolic in the surf finally freed from the sea? Did the heavenly host and hounds of hell take census? Was there a backlog of reincarnated souls? Did chameleons become visible because they finally felt safe? Did the green reaper harvest corn? Did tanks mow lawns? 
Was a global language born? Did volcanoes just misfire or speed their production of lava? When crickets cease their warning siren, did dog tags howl in delight and chase their tails? Did morning doves exchange their shrouds for peacock feathers? Did you notice? I mean, did you even notice? Okay, give it up for Pat Payne. Yeah. Woo. Thank you. I'm going to read you a story. Okay, so before we start the story, who knows where Libya is? Oh, that's pretty cool, actually. More than one person knows. That's really nice. So Libya, just in case you're too scared to admit that you don't know, uh, is right at the very top of Africa. And those of you who know Europe, it's right opposite Italy, but a long way from Italy. And uh, as a lot of you know, the Arab Spring began in 2011, which is where this story starts. And it starts with uh, protests in front of the police headquarters. That's basically how it started, and it spread from there. The story is called Say That You Saw Beautiful Things. Also, one additional thing, as you may know in North Africa, as in a lot of countries, uh, women are treated very much as second-class citizens. In this particular story, they are prevented from running. How many people run? I've got the lights on. Anyone running? Yeah. Okay. So why is running? But if you had, if you weren't permitted to run, um, that would be a bit. I don't like running that much, so that wouldn't be a big problem for me. But um, it is for these two characters. Morning is the best time for running. Nabila says the earlier, the better. But I can never get my eyes open before I hear the stones against my bedroom shutter. I have to go quickly because Nabila is not patient. She will throw bigger stones and those will wake my two brothers and Papa. Mama is already moving downstairs in the kitchen. I dress quickly and pull my hijab on with one hand as I push the window open with the other. Last night's rain means we'll be running in the mud. No convenient tree, but Nabila has moved the ladder against the wall and I know how to com come down quickly in the dark. We carefully put the ladder back against the side of the house. We cross the road and slip into the alleyway behind old Mrs. Doty's house. Even if she's looking out of the window, she won't say anything. She hasn't spoken since they brought back the remains of her son in a small box. They say there wasn't enough to fill a, cotton, a coffin, just pieces of his T-shirt and the silver bracelet from one hand. A bomb, they say, or maybe one of those exploding bullets the police use. Amadou was ten. It wouldn't have taken much to explode him. At the end of the alleyway, Nabila and I take it in turns to keep lookout as we slip off our veils and dresses, our tracksuits underneath. We are both eleven, but I don't need the wrapping band that Nabila must use around her chest now that she's growing. She uses three safety pins to make sure the band is tight. I have seen the red marks after she takes it off. She says it is worth it for the running. You have to see Nabila run to understand this. Even if she wasn't training for the inter-school Olympics, she would still have to run. It is part of her, like my lute, my oud, is part of me. I started playing oud when I was five, and I still can't play chords like teacher does. Chords are difficult. Sitting up is also difficult. Teacher whacks me on the back to make sure I do. We tie up our hair and pull on the baseball caps, checking each other to make sure no hairs are sticking out. We pile the clothes into a plastic bag and hide it under a ragged date palm on the edge of the field off Shari Surya. And then we start. We must not take girl steps. Nabila rolls, her shoulders runs with an easy long stride, spits into the grass. I try spitting too, but my spit is too small and dribbles onto my chin. I use the back of my hand to wipe it away, like I've seen the soccer players do on TV. She glances back on me. Come on, Rayan. I mean, Ali. She runs faster and I keep up, following her long legs flashing ahead. Nabila is the fastest runner I know. To qualify for the inter-school Olympics, she must practice. Even though we must wear the veil all day, even though girls aren't allowed to practice, and even though those stupid protests started three days ago. Papa says it will all die down soon enough. So we have to be clever and careful, because if we are caught, 
Hazard, the auntie from the next street, went to the market without her male chaperone. They took her away to social rehabilitation for three months because of the stain on her family's honor. They say terrible things happened to her in the center. They say when she came home, she fell somehow and hit her head on the bathtub. She died, just like that. Even though I am scared of staining my family's honor, I am here because Nabila is my best friend. We have known each other since we were too small to talk. Also, it is too dangerous for Nabila to run alone, and I am the only one who can keep up with her. Just. She is not even sprinting, and I have to concentrate on making my breath smooth like she taught me. In, two, three, four, out, two, three, four. In the faint dawn light, I watch her stride become longer, her legs stretching out, her whole body moving like liquid. I must concentrate on my breathing. In, two, three, out, two, three. I am panting like a dog. As I make another attempt at breathing, I crash into her because she has stopped. I can't ask any questions because I'm out of breath. Nabila is motioning with her chin towards the far, far end of the field. Six boys are lined up like a poster for a bad movie. Black pants, white shirts. They want us to come over. Why aren't they at morning prayers? And then I see them, the black armbands with the red and green circles, the boys of Free Ulema of Libya. If we are to speak, they will know. If they pull off our hats, they will know. We are dead. Nabila is standing, legs apart, staring back at them. I realize they haven't seen yet that we are girls. I say quietly, if we run now, we can get away. If we run now, they'll follow us. Listen, just do what I tell you. Don't speak at all. You're not able to speak, okay? I nod. People are always telling me I talk too much anyway. Now, pretend to fall and slip over. I may too talk too much, but I'm not clumsy. Trip over now. She sticks her leg, leg behind me. I trip, throw up my arms, and we both fall over. Laughter from the boys. Get as much mud on you as you can. She quickly fix, flicks dirt onto her face. I shove my face into the red mud and feel it oozing into my hair. Nabila stands with her hands on her waist. Look what you did, you idiot. Nabila's hat is tilted, but her hair is hidden. I tug my hat down with filthy hands. We slop across to the boys who are still laughing. They are all tall and have shoulders like professional wrestlers. The leader, with a beard and a grown-together eyebrow like an angry caterpillar, holds a hand up. We are not to come too close. I stand a little behind Nabila, even though I am trying to be brave. They give us God be with you, and I almost give wa alaika masalam before I remember I am to be silent. Nabila growls her greeting in a strange, deep voice. Caterpillar eyebrow nods like he is our uncle, and we should respect him. I see you are training, and that is good, but you mustn't miss morning prayers. Your father knows you are here. There are many dangers for the young. Beneath the sludge of mud, my knees are shaking. Another boy with a nose like it has been shut in a door says, Take off the hats. We need to see your faces. Nabila growls, It is the uniform. The teacher will beat us. Caterpillar eyebrow takes out a piece of paper. Never mind that. You are a good runner. I want you to take a message. Nabila's hands curl into fists. The pink nail polish I put on for her yesterday is there beneath the crust of dirt. She says, but you have a phone. Caterpillar eyebrow holds out the paper. Sometimes a phone is not the best way to send a message. Nabila mustn't show her painted nails. I step forward and hold out my hand, but Caterpillar eyebrow snatches the paper away. Not you. You would drop the message in the mud. Or wipe his nose with it, Ibn il Hamar. Flat nose makes the stupid son of a donkey joke and the others laugh. I step back. Slowly, Nabila rubs one hand against the back of her pants and holds it out, palm up. Caterpillar eyebrow gives her the paper and she immediately scrunches it into a ball and holds it against her side, pink sparkly fingernails tucked in. I can feel my heart pushing out of my throat. I cough loudly and wipe the back of my hand over my face, spreading more mud. The boys look at me and shake their heads. Someone says, Haiwan animal. Caterpillar eyebrow says, you know the post office. El Samani. Nabila has forgotten to use her growly voice and it comes out too high. Flatnose says, this one is still a girl. Freeze. Caterpillar eyebrow turns on Flatnose. Is it so long since your voice came and went like his? Flatnose jerks his chin at me. The other one is quiet. Nabila's growl is back in place. My brother cannot speak. He is dumb. I can see Flatnose is ready with an insult, but Caterpillar eyebrow says, the dumb also have their place in Allah's plan. 
He reaches out one hand and grabs the rim of my hat. I'm ready to pass out when he tugs it down. He laughs. I stand still. The downward jerk has loosened the coiled up hair. What if it comes out? I never thought my hair would get me killed. If no one asks me to look up, if I can keep my head still, the hair might stay under my hat. Go and find this man, Musa. He will be at the post office with a green scarf. Give him the paper. Tell him we march in an hour. Caterpillar eyebrows stared hard at Nabila. What is your name? Hasib. Nabila's left leg has begun to shake. My knees are almost rattling. And your father's name? Uh, Aldasadi. Flatnose speaks up. I know that family. I keep my eyes on the ground. Please don't let them ask any more questions. Please let Nabila and me go safely. I will pray every day. I will give up my new Justin Bieber poster, even though I saved for three months to buy it. Flatnose is not ready to let us go. How is Hamida, the old uncle? I have not seen this one. Nabila's voice is shaky. That's because there is no Hamida. Flatnose shouts with laughter. We have serious business and you are playing games. Caterpillar eyebrow turns back to Nabila. Now run and give the message. Don't talk to anyone on the way. Because if you do, we'll find you. Nabila and I turn and run toward the high school. This time I'm almost faster than her. My hair is slipping, slipping, pulling against the hat. We reach the bushes near the road, and my hat flies off, the hair falling out for everyone to see. Nabila pushes me to the ground. We are crouching, gasping for breath. Neither of us can move. Finally, Nabila pokes her head out, darts out, and snatches up the hat. We fix each other's hair and make sure the hats are pulled down. My legs are too shaky to stand up. Nabila, you are the bravest person I know. Please let us go home. Nabila is checking her chest band. How go home? We must take the message. But it's almost light now. People will see. People see only what they want to see. They didn't realize. They think we're two boys on a morning run. That's all. And if we don't go, they'll find us. I have a brilliant idea. But they won't get us. They'll be looking for two boys. Even a beating is better than social rehab. Use your brain, Rianne. If we don't deliver the message, they'll ask questions. Boom. They'll find out we're not the Alder Saudis and we aren't boys. Come on. We'll just give the message to Green Scarf and go home to our loving parents. We set off running again. Why couldn't Caterpillar Eyebrow just text like everyone else? We run past the gas station where the trucks are lined up. The road bends east towards the clinic where the sky is leaking pale gold as we turn left for the post office. This is where the tourists come to wait for their guides to take them around the old city. I can see a few are there already even though it's early. They wear ugly-looking pale pink and beige clothes like they've been left out in the sun too long. Our city is more beautiful, they say, than Tripoli. Tourists come to stay in modern hotels and walk through the ancient streets that go back to the 6th century. They say that to see a Benghazi sunset spoils the visitors forever. Something is different. On the other side of the post office, men are standing around in groups after morning prayers, but they're not going home. It is like they're waiting for something. Some have cell phones pressed to their ears. There are so many people, it's going to be impossible to find one man with a green scarf. I'm about to tell Nabila we should just give up when we see someone standing on a low concrete wall. He is wearing the green scarf and looking around. This can't be the right Musa. It's my music teacher, Karim Musa, who taught me the oud since I was five. I tug at Nabila, but she doesn't notice. I get behind her, grateful to the crowd that moves together and apart like the sea. Teacher will see two small boys under two small hats. We finally reach him. Nabila holds out the paper and teacher takes it. As we turn to leave, he looks at her face, tries to look under the rim of my hat. I keep my face turned away, but the crowd is pushing enough that Nabila and I are soon separated from him. The post office isn't even open, but the crowd is bigger and noisier than usual. Can all these people be here for stamps? Someone puts a hand on my shoulder. I spin around. An old man says, you boys should go home. This is no place for you. Nebula grabs my hand and we try to push through the crowd, but more people are coming and we are thrown back against a wall. Someone shouts, let these kids go. A tall man swats both of us across the shoulders. What are you doing here? Go home to your parents. Nabila stumbles to her knees and her hat almost falls off. I throw myself across her and both of us fall to the ground. I jam her hat back on her head. No one has seen. No one is paying attention. Everyone is talking and texting. Did you hear? Is it starting? 
Harim Musa is lifted high into the air. He shouts. It takes a long time before people listen. He's saying strange things. The time has come, brothers. We must be prepared to face the worst. We must be free. The men are cheering, raising clenched fists in the air. The crowd begins to move away from the post office. Why is teacher shouting slogans? The crowd moves to the first ring road and we are pulled along with them. We hold hands. We mustn't be separated. As the crowd walks, they chant. No one is chanting the same thing. I don't know what the, wo what the words are. Nabila and I try to cross the road, but more people come and we are pressed back. It's no longer a sea, but the crowd is a hungry monster pressing us apart with its many arms, many legs. A large man moves forward, ignoring our joined hands. He pushes between us, and Nabila's hand slips from mine. I can't even call out. I hang on to my hat as I am sucked back and forth, and as I am finally pushed out, I stumble against broken concrete. My knee is bleeding, and I sit on the curb to catch my breath and wipe off the blood. How will I find Nabila now? What am I going to tell my parents? Behind me, someone is talking in English. I turn around and see a small man, his metal name tag a faint glow in the dim light. He hasn't seen me. He's standing very straight, waving one arm as though speaking to someone. Sir, madam, there is no problem. All is safe here. Just a few young hotheads. Allow me to take you to the old city. Let us not dwell on this little disturbance. We will create the beautiful memories of the real Benghazi, the jewel of the North Africa. We can say that you saw beautiful things. He clears his throat. He starts again. <clears throat> Sir, madam, there is no problem. He breaks off as two tourists approach. He hurries over and beckons them to the waiting car. In the growing light, I can see teacher walking towards me, his green scarf now draped over the head of someone he is carrying in his arms. Nabila. I am up and running despite the throbbing knee. Is she dead? He falls to his knees as I reach him, and I sit so that I can cradle Nabila's head in my lap. Under the scarf, there are dark bruises down one side of her face. Her eyes are shut. Her tracksuit is covered in dirt. I want to see if there are other wounds, but teacher puts out a hand. I must not uncover her in public. I will find a taxi. We must get her to the hospital. Her chest lifts and falls quickly in half-breaths. Is she bleeding under the tracksuit? Teacher returns. Ryan, what foolishness is this? Don't you realize you could have been arrested, even killed? There are long scratches down Nabila's neck that disappear under her shirt. Teacher slowly breathes in and out. They discovered she is a girl. You are dressed like boys, Ryan. People cannot tolerate this kind of behavior, this deception. She is lucky they only gave her a few slaps. It could have been worse. They didn't have to hurt her. What harm did she do? But teacher is looking toward the city. Ryan, we are fighting for our freedom. It is our turn. We are doing this for our country. His words are for them. The crowd of men marching up and down. He jumps to his feet as he sees a taxi. Nabila moves her lips. I can see she is trying to say my name. I touch her hair. Nabila, I am here. Together, teacher and I lift Nabila into the back of the taxi. I carefully slide in beside her. Even social rehab would be better than seeing Nabila so silent, her breathing so shallow. Teacher sits in front with the driver. As we drive away, I hear jeers, shouts, the smashing of glass. Someone calls through a megaphone. Teacher begins to open the window and then rolls it shut. The shouting is angry, joyful, as I hear the first round of gunshot. The men are celebrating something I don't understand that isn't for me or Nabila. I put my hand over her eyes. Thank you. And I would now like to introduce Dora McQuaid. She is dedicated to using her personal and professional experience, education and skills to assist people in exploring the truths of their own lives. Her work has been published in plays, films, musical works, literary journals, law enforcement training programs, as well as posters, calendars and greeting cards. Okay. In addition to numerous awards, Dora's dedication to her work on sexual and domestic violence was honored in 2012 by her image replacing that of former Penn State football coach and convicted child sex offender Jer Jerry Sandusky in the Inspirations mural by artist Michael Pilato in State College, Pennsylvania. 
Please welcome poet, speaker, teacher, and international activist, Dora McQuaid. The microphone is not on, is that purposeful? We're not on? The recording. Okay, great. Thank you. Before I start, I want to, in particular, thank Sandra and Pat for joining me here. Sandra, especially for making this happen. Um, we met in 2011 at a retreat it, at Ghost Ranch, Georgia O'Keeffe's Ghost Ranch in Abiquiu, New Mexico. There was um, a retreat that was hosted and organized by an uh, international literary arts organization called A Room of Her Own Foundation. They support women writers, um, mostly in the States, but around the world. And I had the privilege of being there, um, having won uh, an award to join that program. And Sandra and I met, I think, on the first day, if memory serves, and knew somewhat instantaneously that we were going to know each other for a long time. And it was a very similar circumstance with Pat when we met many years ago at the Taos Poetry Circus, the World Circus, which at the time was one of the largest international poetry festivals. Um, it ran for 22 years, and I was teaching at Penn State at the time and spending my summers in Taos to get away from all of the exposure of doing work around domestic and sexual violence during a time when the whole world was not talking about domestic and sexual violence. So I would run away to the desert in New Mexico. And Pat was there with the circus and was the and remains the defending heavyweight champion of the Taos Poetry Circus to this day. So we met there, and similar circumstances, I knew at the moment of our meeting that we were probably going to know each other for a long time, and we have now known each other for a long time. And I'm so grateful to both of these women because when I called and said, hey, we're going out on tour with my book and I'm coming to L.A. and we need to get back on a microphone together and first time for Sandra and I together, both of them said yes and when. So it brings me great joy to be able to be here with two women that not only do I love them, but I have mad respect for their presence in the world and the way they navigate it. So, um, and I'm also grateful to Moore Park and everybody here who was involved in making this happen. Um, very much grateful to the folks involved in that. And I know you're celebrating what you're referring to as the year of wellness, and I know that the, know that the focus is specifically on both on domestic violence, correct? That's part of it. Okay. Um, I'm, I'm kind of, as bizarre as this sounds, overjoyed that there is a focus on domestic violence. Um, I wish that we didn't need the focus, but we do. The statistics for both domestic and sexual violence are beyond alarming. Um, they are beyond outrage at this point. Uh, Eve Ensler, who wrote the play, The Vagina Monologues, Tony Award-winning play, I know it was performed here on campus back in 2005. Eve Ensler began a, a, the largest in the history of mankind, the largest mass protest that happens every Valentine's Day all over the world. It's called One Billion Rising. And I have been involved in One Billion Rising both of the years that we've, we've had it. Um, when Eve started this, people kept asking her, why One Billion? What is it about the One Billion rising against violence against women and girls? And based on the statistics that we have from multiple international organizations, 
we know that one billion women on the planet have either been beaten, abused, raped, assaulted, you name it. One billion women on the planet have been through one form or another or multiple forms of both domestic and sexual violence. And in Eve's words, she says one billion women assaulted is an atrocity. I call it a pandemic. It's beyond epidemic. It's now at the point of being a pandemic around the globe. And since 2011, when the, Sand the Sandusky scandal broke, we've seen sort of an unprecedented level of media attention and public awareness around both the issues of, of both, uh, both the issues of domestic and sexual violence, which, you know, is alarming to many people, but both of those forms of violence tend to exist in a vacuum, tend to be suffered in silence, tend to be held in silence for generation after generation. So the benefit of having if there is any benefit, and I'm hesitant to even use the word, but the benefit of having these scandals like the Sandusky scandal and some of the situations within the Catholic Church and the Boy Scouts and any number of athletic programs and the NFL, and it goes on and on, having them surface means that the secrecy and the silence are both being broken and the conversations are beginning to happen. In the year following the scandal with Jerry Sandusky, in one year alone, the male reporting of having been sexually assaulted as children increased by 52 percent. One year, 52 percent more men came forward and said that they too had been victimized as children. So when we break that silence, we also have the opportunity beyond breaking the silence to know that we're not alone and to begin the healing process and to move forward and access some of the resources that are available. There are incredible array of international resources available for people who have been victimized and who are working on the healing process itself. And by moving forward, every survivor that comes forward and says, yes, this happened to me, they are standing as example to all of the other survivors who are still living in silence, standing as example of, yes, I can do this. There is a life beyond the violence. There is a possibility for me to heal and move forward from the space that I myself did not choose for myself, but that was inflicted upon me, um, which is part of why I'm so dedicated to doing the work that I do, because I myself stand as one of those examples. And I don't just do it in this country. I'm doing this work internationally at this point. And I am quite proud, not happy about it, but quite proud to say that I, too, am a survivor of both domestic and sexual violence. And it is by coming forward using poetry and performance to articulate my own experiences, not only within the victimization, but far more importantly, in the spaces that came after the victimization that allowed me to step into the life that I now live. By sharing those experiences, I'm yet one more voice in the mix talking about how do we move forward? How do we address the violence? How do we support the survivors? How do we approach the perpetrators and the predators and the legal system and the judicial system and the rehabilitation programs and the systems and, and, and how do we come together as community members to make sure that our children are safe or if they're not safe, how do we respond together to give them what they need themselves so that they can move forward as well. So we are at a pinnacle point, not only in this country, but in the world, at a point that when I started doing this work 25 years ago, I honestly never believed I would see in my lifetime. I did not think that so quickly we would be in a place internationally where the address of this violence is happening at such a rapid rate.
where people are now actually talking about what they've been through with less stigma um, and with more support and with more resources and more examples that they themselves can depend on. For example, the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia, two years ago, in the history of the kingdom, passed the very first domestic violence law ever passed in the hit history of that kingdom. India passed and implemented its very first ever public education campaign addressing domestic violence in their history as well. Those are just two examples. I didn't think I would be alive to see Saudi Arabia pass a law against domestic violence. So we're making progress, and we make progress by taking action individually and together. And my action was um, initially to write this book, The Scorched Earth. I wrote this book not ever planning on sharing it many, many years ago. I wrote it because I was at a point in my life at the age of 30 where I had survived 30 years of violence. And I was well educated and I had my own consulting company and I had already taught at three different universities and I was resourceful and independent and was never married and didn't have children and yet despite my mother also being a survivor and me telling myself my entire life I was never going to go through the violence that she went through and yet at the age of 30 I was in a desperately violent relationship that escalated very quickly and culminated with me being held hostage for 17 hours by my former partner. And at 30, I thought, I did everything I thought I could possibly do to not end up here. And here I am in a room, a bedroom, with a man with a gun telling me he loves me. How did I get here? How did my mother get here? How did the lineage of violence reassert itself in my life despite all of my efforts to avoid that lineage of violence itself? And so I took a semester off from teaching and I did everything I possibly could to get support, to access resources. I was in counseling. I was in a support group for women survivors of domestic violence. I was stunned most of the time, not only by my own experience, but by the experiences of the other women that, they were, that were being shared in these groups. I was stunned by the legal system failing me and nearly getting me killed the second time when the restraining order was delivered to my former partner which said that the guns needed to be removed from his possession because we had legal proof that I had been held hostage by him already. Um, the Sheriff's Department left a pistol grip riot shotgun in his possession, at which point he spent three days trying to find me, telling everybody he was going to kill me when he did. So it took seven organizations, including the District Attorney's Office and his attorneys to get the last gun back from him and during those 72 hours I had to be kept in hiding to make sure that I was kept alive. So the system was failing me despite my ability to articulate myself, my education, my resourcefulness and I was looking around at all of these other women who had educational um, backgrounds that were not as advanced as my had, mine had been, women with children, women who had been traumatized for years with PTSD, and I thought, not on my watch. These systems need to change. They need to better support the survivors. I'm one of them. And once I get through this healing process, I'm going to stand up and do what I can to help improve the systems. Part of the healing process was writing this book. I wanted to write the book on 30 years and then close the book on it and move forward. I didn't want the violence to define me. I didn't want the history 
to define me. I wanted my response to both to be what defined me. So I wrote the book. Didn't plan on publishing it, didn't think I would ever find a publisher who would publish it, and was going to the support group and listening to the women share their stories, and I often could not share my story in any way other than a poem. And it was through that experience of sharing the poems that the poems started to go public and resulted in me self-publishing the book. It was self-published for 15 years, and then after my image replaced Sandusky's in the mural at Penn State, a publisher contacted me and said, we need to roll this book out again in an expanded edition, which is what I'm on tour with now. And I would like to read from this book. Some of the poems are difficult, obviously. Um, some of them are not, so I'll be sure to share some of those with you as well. Um, October is Domestic Violence Awareness Month in this country. And I have, I have a problem with Domestic Violence Awareness Month because as far as I'm concerned, every month should be Domestic Violence Awareness Month. We know that one in four households in every neighborhood in this country has domestic violence happening in it. Think about your neighbors. Stand on your street, look at the four houses around you, and ask yourself, which house? So if we're picking one month out of the year to focus on that house, when there's so many houses, there's a problem. The book is called The Scorched Earth. Burning. This poem is in parts, burning, one. I have a dream about my brother, older now, and a wolf in his front yard. It is not his house, but he walks around it and the wolf as though they all own each other. Two, I have another dream of me, the 29-year-old me not the insomniac teenager I was back then, but I am back out in the fields of southeastern Pennsylvania as I was then. It is late, 4 a.m. The moon has lit the fields bright enough to send blue back up to the face of the stars. I am walking alone, singing. In the dream, I know the song I am singing is somehow important but I do not know the song itself, its name, or origin. Three, I am in a bar in graduate school, shooting pool with my friend who is telling strangers lies about our life together to see what might be believed. He stops my shot to ask me how old our son is now. I turn my back on him and the strangers. A moment later, I hear my friend tell this one stranger, no one will ever have her. Not entirely, not a woman like that. I clear my throat and shoot. Four, in another dream, I am strapped to the stake, flame below me, my hair moving in the heat. Five, you called me a witch more than once. Distrusting the way animals came to me, heads low, tucked tails, even the mean ones, you said, telling me you'd dreamt me a witch. In the cathedral facing the city square in North Beach, we both for a moment, believe the statue of Saint Francesca to have moved. In the sacristy, her feet take one full step toward us. I can see the fear in your face, feel it mirrored in mine. I will walk forward to meet her, stand in front of her and the crucifixion, in near darkness, but for the flames. I drop a quarter in the box 
and light one candle for my mother. I wake barely Sunday morning in your bed on the third floor, responding to my name on your voice, barbed wire breath in the darkness. You have dreamt badly, a nightmare that had you running prone beside me, panicked, no words to form your fear. I shush you quiet, hold you. In the sun, later, you tell me, you, lonely one, are good for me. Six. I have another dream. In the field again, surrounded at night, my brother is at the edge of a circle of light looking skyward. I know the wolf is with him in this field. I can hear the other animals out there beyond the gathered people. The priest turned away, rights at last withheld. I am staked, suspended, flame below. My hair is moving in the heat. In this dream, my body is set on fire. I am singing. The crowd, forgive me, Father, for I have sinned. They demand this of me. I am singing. I know this song. When I wake, I remember sitting up. I dreamt that I was set aflame, and my body would not burn. Could have been, could have been, for my brother, because I loved him best that Halloween. One Halloween, my brother spent the night as the Tin Man from the Wizard of Oz. For days, he fashioned his costume, white compound bucket torso, washing machine water runoff, tubing limbs, spray painted silver, two coats, hours in between to let them dry. My mother took him to buy silver and black stage makeup. It was an outing of two. He came home with his face in a paper bag, ready for the next night. On Halloween, he began dressing at four in the afternoon. He was 11. It was 1973, Pennsylvania autumn cold. The leaves had been down for at least a week. The wind hit the corn over and over in the kitchen we could hear its voice. When my brother came into the kitchen, he was transformed not just by costume, but also by pride. We were stunned by how beautiful he was, how beautifully stilted his movements were, creaky, restrained, oil can in his left hand. My mother took many pictures. I stayed in the doorway watching my father, watching his son, measuring his son's pride, cigarette in front of him, twitching in his red hand. What does the tin man say? My father asked. My brother's face turned toward the floor my mother stopped with the camera. The quiet came down. We were waiting, hearing the corn. Come on, son. What is the tin man's song? Tell me what he said. My brother mumbled, what? From my father, flick of that burning ash, a heart beat or two. 
and my brother raised himself up smoothly, glittering and undeniable, staring into my father, even edged. He answered, I said, if I only had a heart. That poem is about memory of my biological father, who was actually removed from my family's house when I was very, very young. Um, my mother remarried, thank God, and remarried a lovely man um, who raised my brothers and I as though we were his blood children and actually adopted me, took me to orphan's court at the age of 35 and adopted me so that I would always know that I was the daughter that he had chose. Love sometimes saves us. This poem, was, this poem is called Season, and it's an old poem, and I wrote it um, in the thick of things. I kept trying to remind myself that despite everything I was experiencing, there was still incredible beauty and possibility in the world to keep showing up for. This was one of those moments. Season. I collect leaves, walking alone at dusk in Kentucky autumn for you. 3,000 miles away in Northern California where climate and the wheel of the earth do not afford this turning blaze. Colors like pumpkin, like russet and corn yellow, like deep scarlet, pressed together with an iron between sheets of waxed paper to look like stained glass held to the light of the sun, to remind you of home, of the seasons, of me. I collect colored leaves for you, just like I did at five when a red lit leaf looked like God's magic in my little hands. I'm not going to read the shotgun poem. <sighs> um, it's called The One You Were Afraid I Would Write, and I'm not um, going to go there. It's a difficult poem. It's in the book. Um, it's alarming to me, beyond alarming to me, how often firearms are brought into these situations, of both domestic and sexual violence, the use of weapons as a means of control. And I could say more about that, but I'm not going to. <laughs> I'm going to leave the gun control debate out, outside for now. I'm, I'm skipping far forward into the book to avoid um, some of the more difficult poems about the actual violence itself, including the shotgun poem. Um, this poem does reference it, and it does reference some of the other violence, but not nearly as um, outright a manner. It also references several places in New Mexico where I currently live. One of them is called Tezuki, which is just out, it's in between basically Santa Fe and Taos. It's far north, and it's actually an Indian Pueblo. It's the Tezuki tribe. Um, I also reference Taos and Santa Fe and Trinidad, Colorado. They're all part of this sort of outrageously beautiful region of that part of the Southwest. Um, and I'm just making sure there's nothing else. Yeah, so just those places. Um, it's called Then. In Tezuki, I found the medal. Oval, silver Saint Christopher, the child in his hands. Desainted he was, and yet it was fitting me wanting protection from the one 
who'd been banished. Right there in the market, I put that metal on, praying in front of the delve-eyed Indian who'd sold it to me. I'd had enough shame by then to not fear her judge arm. I wanted release more than her acceptance. I wore a Chris in Santa Fe, in Trinidad. I wore a Chris in Taos beneath black t-shirts that kept growing larger on me. When I returned to the house of vodka and bourbon and goat sweat, I walked back down a hallway I could not walk down in darkness for the fear only months before. The same hallway down which I had been pursued by the quickest drunk I'd ever known. Vodka was oil to him, made him slick and nimble. Even the cigarette smoke couldn't burn the stench or speed out of him. One night, one other hept up night, he paraded down that hallway after me in his flannels as I tried to find my way to bed, saying under my breath, Jesus, not tonight. And he towered up on that one, got me in the corner of yet another bedroom wall and bed, spittle, lip, slicking, you're so full of shit, he said, no, no, you are a piece of shit. Those flannels were maroon and teal, and later he cried. He came to me for comfort, saying, I don't know. I love you so much, but I just don't know. I don't have to tell anyone he never got it. Kept right on towering ever after until I learned the release of the rage that comes with habitual betrayal. The taste of betrayal, the pin prick under the shelf of skin when the heated blood roils out like some brittleness undenied. I learned the rage. It kept me on this side of being almost safe. He was so wounded it took a screamer to get his attention. It took me being wounded again and again to get mine. Until I realized he got off on that rage of his he fed on it as surely as it fed on him. It was the only thing that worked after the vodka and the bourbon and the speed and the porn topped off. By July, he was a done deal every day. And I fingered Christopher on a box chain of silver around my neck. I walked down the hallway of pursuit, unpursued. I called my spirit back, burning candles and sage, soaking myself in lavender and hyssop. Where my own strength fails me, I'd say I'm weak. I'd pray it out loud. Protect me where my own strength fails me. I'd wake some mornings with that oval embedded in the skin of my neck like a new brand. It took five weeks alone. It took learning courage alone in the darkness. It took page after page. It took taking the gun he'd used like a gauntlet off of its shelf of hiding under the jeans that no longer fit him, feeling its weight. Playing fingers where his had been that night on a shotgun made with a pistol grip for ease. I learned then that fear is part of the makeup of the blood. On the coverlet, on the wall, or even under my own skin, fear is part of the body's plan. It always tells you, and it 
like the blood, tastes like aluminum, like salt or betrayal, like the royal, the last boat in. I stopped wearing the medal when I finally had the sense to fall in love with myself. I still take it out of its box by my bed, and I remember Tezuki, the Indian woman with the whippet eyes, and him. I remember peacock feathers in all of their glory, all a shine next to pots that some generous hand had coaxed clay into form. He stood five feet away from me, me changed with the metal hanging beneath one of the hollows of my body. I'd had bruises just a month before. He was right there, but I was looking past him at the peacock feathers, stretching. I'm going to read two more. So when the publisher contacted me after the Penn State unfolding, um, I had I had many conversations with people about this book. The book had been used at that point for almost 15 years in trainings in Pennsylvania for um, police officers, parole boards, um, medical staff in emergency response situations, um, outreach services programs, prisons. The, the poems had been used extensively. And yet, when I had self-published the book, knowing that there wasn't going to be a publisher at the time that I did it that would take it on, it was at the very beginning of me really stepping out and doing this activism work that I now do. And so the book did not reflect the activism. It reflected me getting to this point of being in a place where I could finally step out publicly and really take these issues on and try to use my experiences to improve every law and service and program that I could help improve. And so at the time, the book ended with this poem, which is called Glory and Then Some. I had a friend who, um, when I left, I was on the run. I was homeless for two months. I was on the run. I was trying to stay one city ahead of him. Um, and I was in Chicago, and my wallet was stolen. So now I was on the run, being chased, no ID, no cash, no credit cards, and desperate beyond all measure at that point. And a friend of me said, you have to go back and fight now. If you don't go back and fight now, you'll run for the rest of your life. And it's like climbing out of the Grand Canyon at this point. You don't do it in one day. But when you do it, it is glory and then some. So this was the original ending of the book. Glory and then some. This is how I let go. This is how I let myself live free. This is how I put the burden of generations down outside of me, literally lay it down prone in the dust from which it gathered beside me. The dust is all the grief that came before me that fed this line of girl children until our heads hung with the weight of a shame that had nested in the multitude of us growing. This is how I raised myself up beyond the history. It was her story too. He forced his on her. With my voice, with my voice up raised, with my voice up raised and my head up raised and my fist and my spirit that rattles on about hope 
and about hope and about hope up raised. My fist is adamant, uncurled, it is compassion waving. This is my girl child strong, this is my boy child tender, these are my children, they are part of the song. This is how I let go. With that song that is not words, but is the sound of emotion, like the violin, like the one egret, like the coyote at dusk. A song without words, but an upraising all the same. It is a glorious noise, this letting go, the grief unfurled, the shame exposed. There are no words for these emotions, and yet they live on until we sound them go with whatever tools our trades offer. A voice in the song, the funnel rush like fire when hope whirls in and expands, when you believe yourself enough to love, to be loved, to be forgiven. This is how I move on. This is how I let myself live free. This glorious noise stating and naming and claiming and then letting go. This voice. It is love that saves us, makes us new again and again. Hope is power. Love is hope. The joy in the song is the gratitude to know hope again, once and for all. I raise my head. I raise my voice. I survived. Yes, you did too, I know. And now we thrive. That was the original ending of the book. And then I spent so many years going out and doing programs and writing poems for specific situations. The women in Juarez who are being tortured and murdered in the desert towns between the border of Texas and Mexico. I worked with the Pennsylvania Coalition Against Rape, the Pennsylvania Coalition Against Domestic Violence. Um, the Pennsylvania Commission Against Crime and Delinquency. I went into more prisons than I can count at this point, reading from this book to felony offenders to talk with them about what they had done when they had created a victim. And when we started talking about putting this book out again, we made the decision to include some of those poems that showed the transition of me going from this private experience out into the public realm to try to be one of the very many voices for change that we are seeing in the world. And the poem that I would like to end with is a poem that I wrote about my experience of going into the prisons and working specifically with male offenders. This was um, a maximum security facility that I went into uh, many times in the state of Pennsylvania. And it was part of the Impact of Violence program that is throughout the state of Pennsylvania where it's basically restorative justice and reconciliation where survivors are brought in and they sit and speak with people who are convicted of similar crimes that those survivors have experienced in an effort to give the survivors an opportunity to confront the crime itself and to give the offenders the opportunity to hear what their crime has created, what it has done to another human being. This poem is called For Giving, two words. For the participants of the Impact of Violence program at the Pennsylvania State Correctional Institution for Men at Houtsdale and for Dawn McKee. They write me letters, their fourth grade handwriting, 
the paper scored by pen and pencil indent from the force and focus of their intention. Often on blue lined loose leaf paper, occasionally on colored construction paper, sometimes on coloring book pages mounted to the colored paper and then folded like the greeting cards I made at age eight with the Crayola 24 pack and its back box sharpener. When I unfold the pages, their breath reaches up to me as though captured while they held it through the crafting and the writing. I think always of their hands, the length of fingers, the scoring of lines and scars on palm and finger face, the thickness of their wrists, the hollowness in the cups of them when they are at rest. And then I think of the capacity of these same hands, these hands that write me letters, that craft cards for me, for rage, for violence, for annihilation. One reading I did, I was edgy and scared before them. I felt on the wrong side of the door again. There was no screaming this time, no blood temple hovering, no chest beating menace in the vicinity of my heart. But I was behind the barbs again. Three layers of it rolled above the chain link and the trips and the vastness of the open fields beyond the barriers. My eyes kept returning to the crows in those fields, above the eyes and heads of those men, above their hands, which I could barely stop watching, barely escape vigilance of their positioning, of their foretelling. I was watching breathing patterns too, and muscle twitches, waiting for the spring toward me as I read poems of my blood father's wrath and my lover's rage and my spirit caving like an animal gone to ground, curling around the wounding before learning to rise again, enough to do all of this telling. The crows gave me comfort, their wheel and loft, their raucousness reminded me, I leave here soon. I needed reminder that escape again was a possibility. I told myself, the crows will carry me until I can cross the barbs again and let sleep find me while dawn drives us away outside safely together. When I did look up from the poem into the hour, afraid of the hands of the man in front of me at the end of his six foot, five inch frame that had wrung out the life of a woman, those hands were steepled before him. He was hiding the crying, but I could see it. I met his eyes finally. He lowered his hands. We cried together while the room of men dressed in Department of Corrections mauve issue hung on around us. Silent then, I left. I dreamt of him behind the barriers. He wrote to me, shared a poem and his own dark history behind its making. He ended his letter with, God bless you. The indentation in the paper on those words was a ripple, and on the words, you saved me, I am grateful. I rubbed my finger over the ridge he'd made with the giving. His hands made this bridge from there to me as my voice 
made the bridge from here to him. And this is how we save each other. With our hands and the breath between us. Thank you. stick um <laughs> so in the beginning of your last one um you like in I, it was kind of ambiguous to me whether you were talking about like like children writing to you or prisoners and i was just curious whether or not that was like intentional when you were writing it it was actually mm -hmm. intentional um oh. okay the microphone sorry um it was intentional not in any way to diminish the men in the system um, what I experienced in all of the prisons that I went into was, and, and this is heartbreaking to me, um, over 70% of the people who are incarcerated in this country have a history of having been abused as children. Over 70% of the people incarcerated have a history of having been abused as children. 72% of the people in the system have drug and alcohol issues that were ne oftentimes never addressed until they got in the system. And what I experienced again and again, um, the first time they asked me to go into a prison, I was like, are you, what, crazy? No, I'm not doing that. I'm not putting myself in that position. And then I, I got really confronted um, about my immediate reaction of no way am I putting myself in that situation, realizing that the night of the shotgun, I could have easily been one of the people in the prison, right? If I had fought back the way that I wanted to, he would not have survived that night just to make the violence stop, right? Self-defense, so many people, especially women who defend themselves against their abusers, are found guilty and convicted and put in prison for incredibly long periods, regardless of how many years of medical records there are proving the extent of the violence that they have sustained. So I had that moment of realizing, whoa, I could have been incarcerated easily. And here I am with all of my judgments saying, no, 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 I'm not going in there, right? When I started to actually research and see what the factors are, you know, 70% of the people were abused as children, 72% of them have drug and alcohol issues. And in most instances, neither the abuse or the addiction issues are ever addressed until they're actually in the system. The resources aren't available to support them before they get in the system. And what I was seeing again and again were these adults who were almost at a certain point in a very childlike state because they were finally in a safe place, and I mean relatively safe because a prison is no way a safe place. Don't mistake that. Um, they were finally in a place where they were getting sustained support, where they were having an opportunity to go back to where the wounding began and because in most instances, the wounding began at a very young age. There was a part of them that was finally having an opportunity to process and be in the wounding of that age. And I saw that age again and again and again. The men and the women both who trusted me with what they had been through were showing me very young parts of themselves that were 
in pain, that were frightened, that were terribly alone, that were abandoned, that didn't believe, think anybody was going to believe them, that didn't think that they would be held in whatever they had experienced. And I saw it again and again. And oftentimes in the system, you know, there's a lot of arts and crafts going on in, in the therapy programs, especially in the group therapy programs. And so many of the men, I, and I kept every single one of these letters and cards that were made for me, they were using, I mean, I have one card that was made out of, a col out of coloring book pages from a Mickey Mouse, you know, Fantasia coloring book. Perfectly in the lines, I mean, this man had spent hours creating this. He colored in the pages, cut the pages out of the coloring book, and created a very large card using construction paper to seal these Mickey Mouse with the magic wand images in to create the card. And then loose leaf paper had written this beautiful letter to me thanking me for coming in and sharing with them what I'd been through. So it's part of the experience there. And it's part of, I was trying to honor this very young wounding that people had carried alone for very many years. We know that people who were abused as children have a much, much higher propensity towards drug and alcohol addiction issues than folks who were brought up in safe and sustained environments. So I was trying to honor them, really, and also acknowledge you know, sometimes this is the first place that that wounded child is ever acknowledged. It doesn't matter if the man or the woman in the system is 36 or 46 or 76. Sometimes that's the first time the wounded child is ever seen. I have a question for Pat. So I'm going to come over here and hand the mic to you. You started in this very extraordinary space and I like I really enjoyed the way that it was difficult you made it look really difficult could you could you talk about the kind of the KKK cones and how this this piece came to be sure I'm not sure which microphone I need to use so um, this is an excerpt from a piece called isolated incidents and I work with a, uh, a group called artists against police brutality several years ago and there was at that time a book about telephone pages, telephone book thick of just images of, of people who had been killed by the police. Um, and the one phrase that kept being repeated over and over was, oh, this was an isolated incident. Oh, this was an isolated incident. Then 500 pages later, oh, this was an isolated incident. So the original piece uh, was a map of Los Angeles with all of these isolated incidents on it. And I came upon the idea of, you know, there's, there's sort of KKK crowns, there's sort of uh, ghostly uh, images, there, there are a lot of things. They also reflect, um, there's a, a tribe in Africa that does beaded crowns that are just like this, white with cones. And um, so I was just sort of playing with this idea of how can we have all these isolated incidents of violence that within the last few years have months have escalated. Um, so many of the names that I read at the beginning of that or the end of that poem were people that were not even captured by the media um, of all races, of all ethnicities, of all across the country. A lot of those people had mental illness issues and the police were called in to deal with some of the mental illness and uh, lo and behold the person winds up being killed. Um, so <laughs> I like doing, uh, pieces that are a little bit confrontational, um, but also that allow people to put their own interpretations on them. And I wanted to point out <laughs> one of the other issues that I have is that a lot of times people ask me about my qualifications. 
Um, I'm not sure how often this happens to others. I know it happens to me to the point where it gets on my, my last nerve. And a lot of that is about projections of, of who people think I am, who people think I should be. You, you know, you have dreadlocks. Can you tell me where I can buy some pot? Um, you know, just kind of off the wall crap. And so I was getting ready to go to an art opening. And I knew, I knew that people were going to be asking me about, whoa, where'd you go to school and what'd you do and, and who'd you study with? And I just detest those conversations because that reflects my background, it doesn't reflect who I am and where I am right now. So I created this uh, shirt that has basically got my CV on it and I just wore it to the art opening. And every time somebody asked me a question, I'd be like, you know, look at the shirt. I don't even want to have this conversation with you. And I feel like I approach my artwork that way, my installations that way. Um, I don't want to necessarily have the conversation. I want the conversation or the dialogue to come from what people may or may not think the work is about. And then maybe at some point I'll impose my, my original idea on you, but I'm not really even interested at that point about my original idea. Um, when you create a piece of artwork, when you even read some poetry, what inevitably happens is you create this, this thing, you know, that comes from your heart or from other places in your body, um, and you let it loose. And then people just interpret it as they will. And you learn a lot about people from their interpretations of what your intentions are. So when you look at this, um, you know, don't worry about what I was thinking about it so much. Just whatever it brings up for you is valid, is important, and is, is right for the moment. Thanks. Um, gee, Sanj, we've got five minutes to get out of here, so what should I ask you? <laughs> no, nothing. It's okay. I'd like to really uh, thank everybody for coming, so thank you yeah. very, very much, and thank you again. Thanks.